So we have a collection of wave functions that we've seen solve the Schrodinger equation. And we understand why some of them need to have complex numbers in them. The one part we don't understand yet, or at least are, uh, don't have numerical value for yet, is this constant n out in front of the wave function, the normalization constant. So we'll solve for that normalization constant uh, the same way we did for particle in a box. And that's by normalizing the wave function, which means by guaranteeing that there's a 100% probability of finding the system in some state described by some values of our angles theta and phi for the orientation of this diatomic molecule that we're representing with this rigid rotor molecule. So if we integrate the probability over all thetas and all phis, we'll, we get one. So we need to ensure that that is true. And remember that when you're doing an integration in spherical polar coordinates, when you're integrating over theta and phi, you don't just integrate over d theta d phi. You need to integrate over sine theta d theta d phi, that integration factor. The connection between this and the wave function is we remember that the probability is the wave function squared, or more specifically for this quantum mechanical system, the wave function's complex conjugate times the wave function is equal to the probability. So we need to guarantee that when we do this integral, wave function times its complex conjugate, sine theta d theta d phi, integrated over all coordinates. So let's write the limits of this integration. I'm integrating over two variables, theta has to run from 0 to pi, and phi runs from 0 to 2 pi. So that's the recipe for how to do the normalization. Take one of our wave functions, plug it into this integral, integrate in this way, and we need to make sure we get 1 uh, out on the other end. So to see how that works, let's take, uh, let's do one of the complex ones. So let's take our wave function that looks like a normalization constant times sine theta e to the i phi. And just so that we see how the complex numbers affect the integration, if we want to normalize that function to find out what the value of this n is, then we'll do exactly what's stated here. I need to make sure that 1 is equal to the integral of phi from 0 to 2 pi, theta from 0 to pi of complex conjugate, so that's n sine theta e to the i phi with all the i's turned into negative i's. So I turn that i into a negative i. I should also say n, I don't know the value of n, that could be i or it could be a complex number. That needs to be complex conjugated as well. So that's the complex conjugate of the wave function multiplied by the wave function itself. So that's the n without a star sine theta e to the i phi without having turned it negative. And then the integration factor sine theta, d theta, d phi. So that's the integral we need to do. We can clean it up a little bit. The uh, n's we can pull out of the integral. Those are just constants. So n star times n, that's n squared. Squared in this specific way we mean when we're talking about complex numbers. Uh, I have a double integral. 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi. Sine, sine, sine gives me three factors of sine. The complex numbers turn out to be not a problem at all. e to the minus something times e to the positive, same thing. Those cancel each other and just make 1. So the e to the i phi, e to the minus i phi terms just give me a 1. And I've already accounted for the sine theta, so I just need d theta d phi. The integral is looking much simpler already. I've got an n squared. The phi integral, this outer integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, there's no phi's in here. I don't have to work hard to do that integration. Integral of d phi is just phi. Phi evaluated from 0 to 2 pi gives me 2 pi. So the phi integral is done. The phi integral is equal to 2 pi. And now I have, I'll go ahead and rewrite the, the theta integral, integral of sine cubed theta d theta. All right, so what do we do here? There's a few options. Probably you don't have this integral memorized. Um, 
you can use an integral table. Go to the internet, look up that integral. There's no shame in using an integral table. Somebody else has already done the work of doing this integral. You can use the integral table to find out what it is. But it's not actually that hard an integral to do. So I'll show you the trick we need to actually perform this integral ourselves. And that trick is uh, use substitution. So if we look back and think what I'd like to have is for one of these factors of, of sine theta d theta to be lumped into the du when I do my u substitution. So if one of my factors is sine theta, the reason I want to have one of these factors taken up by the du is if I have just sine squared left over, I know a lot about how to do integrals of sine squared. So what does u need to be in order for its differential to be sine theta? It needs to be something like a cosine theta. And now if I think about the signs, if I make u equal to cosine theta, its derivative is negative sine theta. So if u is cosine theta, du is minus sine theta d theta. And that allows me to rewrite my integral. I've got n squared, 2 pi. When I transform the integral itself, when I rewrite this using u's, I need to remember also to transform the limits of the integral. So my integral was theta running from 0 to pi, but u is going to run from, when theta is 0, u is equal to cosine of 0, which is 1. When theta is pi, u is equal to cosine of pi, which is negative 1. So my integral is running from 1 to negative 1 once I've converted it into u. And now my integral sine cubed, I'd rather think of that as sine squared times sine. Sine squared, uh, let's do this one step at a time u squared is cosine squared. So 1 minus u squared is sine squared. So when I think of this sine cubed as sine squared times sine, one of those sine squareds I can write as 1 minus u squared. And the other sine I can write as a du with a negative sign. So I'll stick a negative sign out in front of the entire thing. So now I just have this integral to perform integral of 1 minus u squared, and that's a much easier integral. There's no trigonometric functions in there. So I've got minus 2 pi n squared. Integral of 1 minus u squared is u minus, so integral of 1 is u. Integral of u squared is u cubed over 3. And I'm evaluating that between 1 and negative 1. So let's. Inserting the top limits, when u is equal to negative 1, u cubed is also equal to negative 1. So I have a minus negative 1 divided by 3. That's the two terms I get when I insert negative 1 for u. And then I subtract what I get when I insert positive 1. So when u is equal to 1, u cubed is also equal to 1. So now I have a little bit of arithmetic left to do, and I've run out of room. So let's move up to the top. So my normalization problem has become a 1 on the left side and side must be equal to negative 2 pi n squared times everything that's left in brackets here. I've got a negative 1 minus 1. That looks like a, a negative 2. And a 1 third minus a negative 1 third. So that looks like a plus 2 thirds. Negative 2 is negative 6 thirds. If I add 2 thirds to the gap, all together, I get negative 4 thirds. So I've got 2 pi n squared times 4 thirds. That negative sign cancels the negative sign on this negative 4 thirds. And I need for 1 to be equal to 8 pi over 3 times n squared. My goal is to solve for the value of n. So if I leave n by itself, move everything else over to the left-hand side, the 3 comes to the top. The 2 times pi times 4 is on the bottom. All this will be true. My, my wave function will be normalized. Its integral when I square it will be equal to 1 if the value of n squared is equal to 3 over 8 pi, or if the value of n is equal to square root of 3 over 8 pi. And now I don't have to worry about, remember the reason we kept these 
uh, vertical lines here on these magnitudes is because I didn't know if n was going to turn out to be real or complex. Turns out I can get by with an n that's a real number, square root of 3 over 8 pi, and then when I square it, I get 3 over 8 pi, which is what I was looking for. So we have solved for the value of n. What that means is now we understand the wave function more completely. This particular wave function, the one we've been working with, I can say that that wave function is not just equal to n, some unknown constant, but it's equal to square root of 3 over 8 pi times sine theta e to the i phi. So that's what we've uh, succeeded in doing is we've normalized that wave function. If, if we, someone gives us a wave function without the constant normalization constant specified, we can go through this process to determine the normalization constant and be able to write down the uh, fully correct wave function. That process is not a lot of fun. It's fairly tedious. The main purpose of this video lecture has been to show you, the, the, in case you need to do it, the procedure you need to go through, how, what, what exact integral you need to perform and set equal to 1 in order to solve for that value. Sometimes we don't end up needing the normalization constant, so often we will just leave it unspecified, as we did when we first wrote down these wave functions. But if we do need to know the value, uh, then we can uh, calculate it.